at internal medicine in my field, palliative care and hospice, to educate as many students as possible. Um, because I feel like palliative care and hospice is not so much of a talked about field. And a lot of people don't talk about um, some very touchy feely topics in medicine, like how to deal with the patient's death. And that's something everyone's going to see at one point, you know, in their lifetime, if you want to pursue medicine, no matter what career field you go into in medicine, whether it's a nurse or nurse practitioner or PA, whatever it is, at one point, you will see a patient die. Um, and so I just kind of wanted to give like an intro to that an intro to my field. So a little bit about me, I am an internal medicine doctor. I actually grew up in Dallas, Texas. I went to UT Austin for undergrad and then I moved to New York for medical school. I went to Toro College. And then after medical school, I pursued a degree in internal medicine. I did my residency in internal medicine. And the reason I chose internal medicine is because it's such a vast field and I felt like you could do so much with it. And there's so many things you can specialize in if you do internal medicine, um, as opposed to, you know, other fields, internal medicine, the possibilities are limitless. You could do cardiology, which is a heart doctor. You could do pulmonary, which is a lung doctor. You could do rheumatology. You could do endocrinology. The list is just endless, including palliative care and hospice. Um, and so that's why I chose internal medicine. So I currently work as an internal medicine hospitalist. A hospitalist is someone that manages your care when you're admitted into the hospital. So let's say if someone goes to the emergency room with chest pain and the, you know, the ER doctor calls me in to evaluate the patient and I feel like, okay, this patient is having a heart attack. And so then we admit, it, admit them to the hospital, into the hospital, and I'm the doctor that manages their care with other specialists. So I'm the doctor that will say, okay, he's having a heart attack. Let me contact the cardiologist, which is the heart doctor. So you're kind of like the liaison between all the specialists and you kind of get exposure to all the specialties, which I like about being an internal medicine hospitalist. And so that's what I do about one week or two weeks out of the month. The rest of the time I practice as a palliative care and hospice doctor. And I'll talk a little bit more, more about what that field is because it's just not a topic most people are familiar with. Um, and I currently work as a locum physician. Um, I'm not sure if you guys are familiar with what a locum doctor is, but a locum doctor is someone that goes to places where there's a shortage of doctors. So a lot of my assignments that I do are in, so I'm basically a travel doctor. You know how there's travel nursing, there's also travel doctors. So I go to a lot of places in the United States where there's a shortage. And a lot of times it's a lot of rural you know, rural areas in the US. Um, when I was done with fellowship and residency, I knew I wanted to do some volunteer work. And when I was doing some research, I realized there's actually a lot of areas in the United, self, United States itself that have a severe shortage of doctors. And so I worked with these companies that fly me to these areas for like five days out of the month. And I stay there for five days in a hotel and I work at a hospital, you know, where with other doctors where there's not a lot of medical doctors close by. Um, so that's very rewarding in itself. Um, and then throughout the pandemic, since February, March, um, I worked at a pop-up hospital in New York City, which was erected because there was, you know, all the hospitals in New York City were really um, crammed with the amount of patients we were seeing because of the surge in inpatient admissions. So the government created these hospitals and they hired doctors like me that are locum doctors that go to places that where there's a shortage. And so I worked at the pop-up hospital for five or six months. My base is New York City. So this is where I travel to other places from. So I live in New York City, but I go to other places wherever the help is needed. But majority of the time I'm in New York City itself because, you know, Doctors are needed everywhere, especially in big cities like this, and especially right now during coronavirus. So I'm going to talk about a case. I want to talk about a case that I usually see as a palliative care and hospice doctor because I want this to be like a, like a, um, like a shadowing session. So you're kind of with me, um, seeing a patient, and you're seeing my thought process through things. So the, a case that I usually see, and th these topics might be heavy. Um, but these are important topics to talk about. And I wanna explain things to you about, you know, what is it that my thought process is? What are some of the things I think about and some pathophysiology of things? 
Um, and I'll try to condense everything as much as possible in the time we have. So a common case I would see as a palliative care and hospice doctor is, let's say if I'm working inside the hospital inpatient on the consult service, a 45, Miss, Mrs. Smith is a 45 year old female with stage four metastatic breast cancer, is admitted to the hospital with severe pain in the hip, lower extremities, upper extremities due to bone metastasis. Her disease has progressed and she's more tired with decreased ambulation. She follows with the oncology clinic regularly and is currently not a candidate for chemotherapy due to progression of her disease. You are consulted for pain management and goals of care. A little bit of social history about the patient. She is married with three children. She works as a biology teacher in high school and she's very involved in her church and community. So this case presentation to summarize, it's a 45 year old female. She has metastatic cancer. She follows an oncology clinic that are telling, you know, during this case, they might or might not have told her that she's no longer gonna be a candidate for chemotherapy. And so they've called me in because she's having severe pain because of metastasis. And they've called me in to kind of, you know, go through pain management for her and talk about goals of care. So we'll, we'll talk about everything as I do. So first, what is palliative care? So palliative care is a field in medicine that deals with anyone with a chronic serious illness. So that's anyone that has cancer and stage lung disease, kidney disease, um, heart disease. And my job as a palliative care doctor is to do symptom management. So, you know, whether it is help with pain or dyspnea, which is difficulty breathing, um, I provide support to patients and families. And then my job is also to get to know the patient at a deeper level and based on their goals and wishes, give them recommendations on medical treatments they should choose when they are either end of life or they're preparing um, you know, when death is coming near. And so it's a multidisciplinary approach, which means it's not just me as a palliative care doctor. I am on a team with the nurse practitioner, the nurse, the chaplain, um, the social worker, other um, therapists. So it's, we all work on the patients together. So it's not just me on the team. Um, and we'll go through each of their roles. Hospice on the other hand is for patients that have a life expectancy of six months or less. So most people that think of palliative care also automatically think of hospice, but they're actually two different things under the same umbrella. So palliative care is for anyone that has a chronic serious illness. So anyone that's like newly diagnosed with cancer or end stage heart disease, lung disease, hospice specifically is for patients that have six months or less to live. Um, so it's a very specific criteria in order for people to be eligible for hospice. And people think of hospice as like a place people go to, but it's actually a service that is provided. And so it could be the service, this hospice service can be provided anywhere. Um, most commonly patients are provided hospice services at home. So that's considered home hospice, or it could be provided in a nursing home, or it could be even provided when patients are admitted into the hospital and that's considered inpatient hospice. So there's so many services where, um, and places hospice can be provided. Ideally, we wanna provide hospice at home uh, because most patients prefer to die at home um, surrounded by family and friends. So that's an ideal place for hospice to be provided. Um, like I said, it's an interdisciplinary team approach. So it's not just the me, but there's a physician, the nurse, NP, social worker, chaplain, and therapist and grief counselors that are on the team. Uh, so the approach to palliative care and hospice, the reason I enjoy this field is because I feel like it's a mind, body, and soul approach. So we usually tend to patient as a whole and it's not just like specific symptoms that we're treating, we're treating the patient as a whole. So let's say someone is coming in with pain management, not only are you gonna be treating their pain, but I'm also gonna be making sure that, you know, there are psychosocial factors that are coming into play. For example, this patient is 45 years old, she's married with three children. I'm gonna be thinking of that when I see her, you know, are there any social services that need to be provided to the children? Are there any, therapists and grief counselors to kind of deal with what this family might be going through. And then also religion aspect of it. You know, spirituality is a big part of patient's life. 
And, you know, she, in her history, I mentioned that she is religious and she's involved in her community. So I will also be considering involving our chaplain in her care to make sure that, you know, she's not having any religious issues, like any existential crises. You know, some patients, for example, that are very religious, that are diagnosed with cancer, or they might be end of life, might be thinking, you know, is, am I being punished? Is God punishing me? So we just want to make sure that we are, you know, looking at the patient as a whole and not just looking at her for pain. Because whenever we treat a patient, we want to take a whole mind, body, and soul approach. So let's look at the case again, the 45-year-old female with metastatic breast cancer coming in with severe pain in her hips, in her lower extremities. So the first thing I will be thinking of when I see her is that pain management. We are trained as palliative care and hospice doctors in doing really good pain management, whether it is with opioids or radiation therapy or referring someone to radiation therapy. So pain management is a big part of what we do, but the pain management is for patients with chronic illnesses like cancer or heart disease or lung disease. So my pain management is different from a regular pain management doctor that sees patients with chronic pain, like chronic back pain, as opposed to my pain management is for acute pain for cancer related pain mostly. And so what I, my first thought process is that this patient's in pain and that's what I need to treat because she won't be able to engage in any conversations regarding her health if she's in severe pain. And so what's going through my head when I'm seeing this patient regarding pain so when I take a detailed pain history, I'm looking at everything. One of the mnemonics I use is PQRST. So what I'm looking at is what's causing her pain, okay? What, where is the pain located? Um, Q is what's the quality of pain? So in this patient, she might say the pain is sharp, the pain is deep, it's aching. Um, if she's saying that the pain is, you know, burning and tingling, I'm thinking, okay, what type of pain is she experiencing? Because there are different types of pain that exist and different medications are used to treat different types of pain. And then I'm also going to be asking her, does the pain radiate anywhere? Are there things that make it worse? Like in her case, it might be that she, you know, walks and it makes it worse, um, especially since it's bone pain. Um, then I would ask her if she's any, any treatments she's already on. Is there any medication she's already tried? You know, it's possible that this patient already tried like Tylenol and ibuprofen and over-the-counter medications that don't help her. Um, and, and so that's what I'll be thinking of. And based on her history, um, I will think about what type of pain is it that she's experiencing? So one really cool thing about pain, the way it operates, is that when a person is feeling pain, it activates these receptors. And these receptors actually transmit the pain through the descending inhibitory pathway, like all these pathways that exist to the brain to let the brain know that, oh, the patient is feeling pain. Um, and, and so when we use treatments, whether it is nerve blocks or opioids, what these medications do is target these pain receptors that are transmitting the pain. So a common medication we use is opioids. Um, one another common medication that's an opioid that we use is morphine. And so for morphine, morphine targets the opioid receptors, which is the mu receptors, and it blocks it. And so it kind of blocks the pain, you know, reception to the brain. So it's really cool how the treatment of pain is blocking these receptors. And so there's, there's different type of pains that exist. Like I mentioned, there's somatic pain which is pain where there is um, damage to the receptors and the tissue like joint pain, muscle pain, someone you know stabs you, that's a somatic type of pain, whether it's temperature related pain, like you're burning. Um, and so the pain is often described as cramping, gnawing, um, sharp type pain. Nociceptive pain is just a general medical term that's used for physical damage. So when someone breaks your bone, that's a physical damage type of pain, um, like a sports injury or a dental procedure or arthritis. So that's nociceptive type of pain. So this patient that's having, you know, metastatic bone pain, that's a nociceptive somatic bone pain. Neuropathic pain is when there's damage to the nerve, um, when there's nerve injury. So usually we see, we are seeing this type of pain when, um, 
like for example, with diabetic patients. When diabetic patients coming with nerve pain, they usually describe pain as burning and tingling. And, and, and it's a very specific presentation that's worse when walking. And so that, you know, her pain doesn't sound like a nerve pain. It sounds more like a bone pain because of metastatic disease. So let's see. Yeah, so her pain is somatic nociceptive bone pain. And the treatment I would use is opioids. Um, you know, I know opioids have a bad rep, but there's actually a place for opioids and cancer related pain and severe pain is a place for them, especially with these patients, because you want to make sure that they're comfortable and they're not in severe pain. Um, another thing I would be doing before I prescribe any opioids is any additional imaging. So let's say I would be asking her, when is it that your pain started? If her pain started two weeks ago and it's new, I wanna make sure that there's not a new bone lesion that's causing her pain, or is it just the chronic pain that's acting up? So a lot of times imaging is also used to kind of determine where the pain is coming from. The first thing we always do as physicians is we wanna make sure that we're not missing anything. So if someone is coming in with chest pain, we wanna make sure that they're not having a heart attack. If someone is coming with chest pain and difficulty breathing, we wanna make sure they're not having a thromboembolism, which is like a blood clot in their lungs. So we wanna make sure we're covering all bases when someone comes in and getting a detailed, thorough physical exam because that's when being a physician and differentials come in. You have to make sure that you're not missing anything else for the patient and not just dismissing their pain. So before I treat them with anything, a thorough workup and a thorough look at their labs are done. And so with her, in her case, you know, because of the metastatic pain, that's the nature of the pain, I would be using an opioid. Um, there are different types of opioids, morphine, oxycodone, dilaudid, and the choice of opioids depends on the patient's kidney function and renal function. So for example, morphine is excreted by the kidneys. So if someone has kidney disease, I would avoid morphine and use another opioid um, because I don't wanna shut down their kidney functions further. So there's a lot that goes in into choosing the type of opioids that the patients are prescribed. Some common side effects we see with opioids are nausea, vomiting, constipation. Constipation is one of the most common side effects. So anytime I write a prescription for opioids, I'm also writing a prescription for stool softeners and stool stimulants because I wanna make sure that the patient's not constipated because if they are, it could lead to bowel obstruction and, and that causes more harm. And they can also cause drowsiness. The point of doing these pain medications and opioids is not to sedate the patient. It's just to give them enough to where they're comfortable and able to do their daily activities that they were doing before. Um, so, you know, anytime we're given, giving these medications, they're very closely monitored. So then again, with this patient, you know, we're looking at the whole approach, the whole biopsychosocial approach. I'm also going to be thinking that, you know, once I manage her pain and her pain is controlled, I'm going to be thinking, okay, now she has three children and she's married. You know, I want to make sure I'm providing support to her family and friends. Um, she's a biology teacher. I want to explore that. It's a big part of who she is. You know, for example, if I was ever admitted to the hospital and I had metastatic disease and no one even asked me what I was doing or what I did, or I was a physician, I mean, it's a, you know, what people do is a big part of their life. So you always want to treat the patient as a whole and get to know them at a deeper level. And then I would also involve the social worker in her care with this history of three children to make sure that she has enough family support. So spirituality, like I mentioned earlier, is a big part of patient's life. A lot of patients, especially, you know, ones that are diagnosed with a really bad chronic illness like cancer or severe heart disease and lung disease have some existential crises. So that's where our palliative care chaplain comes in that's on our team. You know, she is a Christian and a faith is a big part of her life. So we wanna make sure that, you know, that aspect of her care is also managed. Because sometimes pain is not just, you know, pain you feel, it could also be, you know, emotional pain that patients can feel, you know, pain with, you know, dealing with the family members, like knowing, just thinking the stress of knowing that now they have this illness and their family is going to be involved in their care. So there's so much that goes on for the patient. And as a provider, it's our job to do the whole 
you know, 360 exam and not just deal with one, not just have tunnel vision when we're seeing the patient. And so now that, you know, we're dealing with their pain and we're dealing with their spiritual, we're dealing with their social aspects. One of the common things I do as a palliative care doctor is break bad news. Um, that's one of the toughest part of my jobs and it's never something I take lightly. So breaking bad news is, you know, for this patient, it would be me telling her that she is no longer a candidate for chemotherapy. Now, that's a tough news to break someone, but we're trained in a, you know, we're, we're trained in certain communication skills to use. And these are good skills to have as any type of provider, not just a palliative care hospice provider, not just a hospitalist, but all fields of medicine can benefit from being great communicators. Um, you know, your patients are going to be looking to you for support. They're gonna be looking to you for advice and the way you deliver these news are, is gonna have a lasting impact on them. And so a certain protocol I use, it's called the SPIKES protocol. And what that is, is that, you know, certain steps are taken to make sure that these news is given in a specific format. So the first thing I do is I set up for the interview. So now I'm gonna tell this patient that she's no longer candidate for chemotherapy with the oncologist at my side. And both of us are gonna break this news to her. So I wanna set up the interview. I wanna make sure that, you know, I'm breaking this news to her with her family members around. If she wants, she probably wants her husband or any other family members in the room. I'm gonna make sure everyone is sitting comfortably, not just standing and it's not uncomfortable. I'm gonna make sure it's a quiet environment. I don't wanna break this news with you know, TV going on and Jerry Springer in the background. Like I just wanna make sure that it's a very comfortable environment where we're comfortably able to express you know, what's going on, explain ourselves to the patient and then have the patient have a comfortable environment to express herself as well. And so, a good meeting area is set up. Sometimes it's in the meeting room or sometimes it's just in the patient's room. The next thing I do is I'm gonna assess patient's perception of what is going on. So then I'm gonna ask her, what is your understanding of what the doctors have told you so far? A lot of times as a provider, you will notice that you're telling the patient one thing but they heard something completely different. And there's a, there's a gap in actually what's told and what's being heard. And so the next step is to always kind of ask the patient, what, what do you think is going on with your care? Like what, what did the doctors told, what did the doctors tell you? And this is a great way to assess what the patient knows so far. And then after that, you know, after the patient tells me that, oh, the doctor told me I have metastatic cancer and that I'm on chemotherapy. And this is what I know so far. The next step is I'm gonna ask the patient. So I have some news to break to you can I give you this information? You don't, right after asking them what's going on, just, you don't want to dive straight into, okay, by the way, we're not going to be offering chemotherapy anymore. That's, that's kind of unprofessional. So you always want to ask, is it okay if I share some news with you? Um, is it okay if your family members are in the room when I share this news with you? And a lot of times patients will say yes. There are times because of cultural backgrounds where family members don't, or where the patient just doesn't want to get any bad news. A lot of times, for example, I've heard, you know what, I don't want any bad news. Why don't you talk to my oldest son? Why don't you just talk to my family member? Um, and I, I will do whatever they say. You know, we have to be respectful of different cultural backgrounds, whether it is, you know, whatever culture they're from, every culture has different practices. Um, and then from there, you know, once they say, okay, yes, I want to hear the information, you share the news, you know, the oncologist with me by his side would tell them that, you know, we are no longer going to be giving you chemotherapy because it's doing more harm than good. And the disease continues to progress. After we break this news, then we just, you know, go quiet and let the patient emotionally respond, whether it is, you know, them crying or them being upset and that's important that at this point, you as a provider is really there for them. This is a time for you as a provider to let them know that you're gonna be there for them no matter what. You're gonna make sure that they're as comfortable as possible. We are gonna be here for them, their family. You're gonna help explain things, whatever it is that they need. You're gonna be here for them and not abandon them. Personally, to me, this is a very important part of the conversation because 
good, good medical providers truly show their compassion for their patient. Um, and then after, at the end of the meeting, you just want to summarize everything. Like this is what we talked about and this is what we're going to do and this is the plan going forward. So that's the general way I usually run our meetings. Goals of care is basically when we get to know the patient um, and based on what her wishes are, give recommendations on care. So for example, if someone has end stage heart disease or this patient that has metastatic cancer, she will eventually die. You know, it's possible that she has less than six months to live. And so my job is to kind of get to know her and ask her, you know, when that time comes, do you want CPR? You know, CPR is when we, you know, put the breathing tube in and we try to restart your heart. A lot of times patients will say, you know, I've suffered enough. I am old. You know, I just want to go naturally. Sometimes patients will say, I want to try it for, you know, a couple of days, like put me on the breathing machine, but I don't want to be on there for long term. So it all kind of depends on what patients want. And we're here to support their decisions, but also give them accurate information. We're here to say that, you know what, CPR works 10 to 15% of the time. If you are 80s or 90 years old, then it usually works less than 5% of the time. Even if it works, then it's possible that you're not gonna be able to go back to the quality of life you had. It's possible you might be on the breathing machine for a long time. So what is it that you want? What type of life is acceptable for you to live? Or what type of life would you never wanna live? Some patients say, oh, I never would wanna be on the CPR. Yeah, or I would never want CPR or be on a breathing machine. You know, That's just not the quality of life I would want. Each conversation is different. Obviously, if someone is 20 years old and they're very young, then CPR works for them because they're younger and, and there's a probability that after they receive CPR, they're gonna, you know, there's a higher probability for them to go back to their normal life um, later down the road than someone that's a 90 year old. So it truly, it's a conversation that's very specific to each patient, but it's all based on, you know, getting to know the patient and based on that giving recommendation. And so then I kind of want to dive into um, a more sensitive topic, dealing with a patient's death, um, because that's something I feel like is not discussed enough. Um, and I know this is a heavy topic, but this is something all of us medical providers experience, and it's important to talk about it more openly. So let's say if, you know, you are the resident on call and you are notified that Mrs. Smith, you know, who was admitted back to the hospital because she was having severe symptoms, um, she chose to be DNR, DNI, which means, you know, she would want to go naturally. So you're called at 2 a.m. and you're informed that the patient has died and the nurse is calling you to pronounce her and do a death exam. So what do you do? So before going into the exam, before going into the patient's room to examine her, you want to make sure that you are doing a thorough kind of review, quick review, especially if she's not your patient, you're doing a thorough review of what is it that the patient, you know, came in with. Um, you don't wanna just like walk into the room without even not even knowing patient's name. So first you wanna check their code status, you know, which is are they, do they want CPR? Or do they wanna go naturally? If they want CPR, then they need to, you know, be coded. Um, and, and the code will already start before you even walk into the room. But if in this case, she's DNR, DNI, so I'm gonna to stick to what we do in this case. And then you kinda of wanna read a quick history on her. Like why, is, why was it that she was admitted here again? Um, what's the current treatment she's on? Um, you know, who's involved in her care. Sometimes the chart will say, don't inform certain family members or this and that. So you just kind of want to quickly do a brief review of why she's admitted. And then you go into the room and you perform a death exam. There are a lot of things that go into a death exam that you will be trained on in residency. But a general overview is that you will be looking at her pupils, looking at the pupillary reflex. Then you'll be auscultating her heart to check for heart sounds. A lot of times you'll be doing like a baseline flatline EKG to make sure that she is flatlined. Um, you know, you're going to be auscultating her lungs. You're going to be, you know, obviously before going into the room during this COVID time, I want to emphasize to wear the PPE and wash your hands before you're going to go see the patient because you always want to care about your safety first. Um, 
And then, you know, after the death exam is done, certain times in ICU settings, they do a different death exam where they do an apnea test to see if the patient's brain death. So there's a lot of things that go into the play that you will be, you know, trained on in residency. And then after, you know, you do your death exam and you pronounce the patient, the first thing you always want to do is contact the family and let them know that, you know, their loved one has died. Um, when you call the, call the family member, you always want to make sure that they're not doing something. So the first thing I always do when I call family members is ask them, what are, are you driving right now? Are you in a position where you can talk? Because you don't want to be giving someone driving a really bad news that, oh, their, their wife has passed away. And I mean, they could get into a car accident, you know? So you just, you rather be careful you don't want to risk endanger other people's lives. You know, that's not what you're trying to do. So you always call and ask, what is it that you're doing right now? Are you in a comfortable place to talk? Um, and that also shows professionalism on your end that, you know, you don't, you don't, you're not just trying to hurry up and give the information. You genuinely are concerned. You want to show that you are sorry about their loss. You know, this person just lost someone that was dear to them. And so, you know, you want to do everything in a nice systematic manner and not hurry to th through things because this is another human being you're dealing with, you know. Um, and now I quickly want to just talk about, you know, how to kind of deal with the patient's death. Like death is a normal part of life, but it doesn't mean it's easy for everyone. Um, seeing a patient die is something all medical students or residents or nurses or physicians will do. Um, and it's something that everyone will experience in their career and there's healthy ways to deal with it. So first thing I always suggest, you know, residents and fellows um, that I teach to do is express your emotion. If you've been taking care of this patient for a very long time, you know, whether it's a couple of months or years and sometimes decades for some physicians, you, you know, there's a high probability you got close to them. So you want to let yourself feel the loss you want to express your emotions openly. You want to talk to your colleagues. You want to tell them that, you know, um, I was, I got really close to this patient and I'm sad that he died or she died um, and express your emotions more openly. Next thing you kind of want to reflect, you always want to reflect on what you just saw. You just saw a human die. It's not normal. You know, it, 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 it might affect you. So, you know, it's patient's loss is Everyone deals with it in their own way. One of the books I suggest is that they'll go on as being mortal. It's important to read these like, medical books, not just, you know, pathophysiology and, and things like that, but also these other books that kind of give you an insight on how, you know, physicians deal with patients on an outer level, um, not just the biological level. And then lastly, I want to say that dispel any feelings of failure you know, just because someone dies and someone dies of metastatic cancer or chronic illness, you can't control that. It does not reflect a failing situation on your end. It is not your fault. Um, and so anytime you start feeling like a feeling of failure, you start feeling like it's your fault, you need to talk to someone because it's important you understand that you can't control everyone else's medical issues and death is a part of life. Um, obviously when things get harder, you know, when you start feeling like you're having difficulty sleeping and you're not eating and you start noticing these signs in you after seeing something like this and you need to speak to a licensed therapist um, and you have to speak with someone and you have to get help because if it starts impacting you in a negative manner, that's not good. You know, you won't be able to take care of yourself and most importantly, you won't be able to take care of other patients. Um, so it's important to talk to someone about this. And in general, I wanted to just kind of give a overview of medical advice and then I'll go over some of the questions. Um, so some of the advice I give to, you know, pay, people, people pursuing medicine or going into medical school is that it's important to get a mentor and shadow doctors. You truly don't know if you like something until you actually do it. And, you know, I always went into medical school thinking I'm going to like, I want to be this type of doctor. I want to be an OB-GYN or I want to be a surgeon and this and that. And when you actually keep an open mind and you go through your rotations in medical school, you realize like, okay, this is not something I would want, or these hours are not something I would like. Um, oh, surgery is not something I would want to do, or surgery is something I would want to do. And, and internal medicine is not something I want to do. So 
So it's just important to keep an open mind because there's so many things in medicine and so many specialties in medicine. And, and, you know, I do a bunch of things. So not only do I do internal medicine hospitalists, but I also do palliative care and hospice. And I work as a locum doctor. So there's so many options available to people that pursue this field that the possibilities are endless. And it's important to just keep an open mind. I also tell people, make sure you're volunteering. You know, all of us go into medicine to help people and cliche as it sounds, you wanna be able to tell, you know, the medical admissions committee that the reason you're going into this because you also want to help people. And so volunteering is a great way of showing that you are able to help. Um, you know, study early, uh, study early, apply early. I applied to medical school right when the portal opened up. You know, you're able to um, upload documents and upload rec letters. Make sure all of that is done early because rec letters take a while. Um, make sure that all your, you know, scores and your and your transcripts, everything's opened up. So when the time is read, the time is up for you to submit things. Your first application they see. And also study early when you're studying for these medical tests, it's always a marathon. It's never just, you know, you can't really study overnight and pull all nighter. You have to be studying way in advance. Um, and then get involved in extracurricular activities like this organization, Medical Marvels and other organizations that are out there. Just, just doing things like that also shows that, you know, you're exploring the field of medicine. You're, you're trying to see what's out there. And that's always, that's always good. Um, and then also, I always tell every all students just, you know, just be kind and be humble. You know, I, I personally feel like the best doctors are the ones that are super nice to their patients and, and they're kind and, and they treat other humans well. And that's always a really big part of being a good doctor. It's not just the medical knowledge, you know, but it's also how you treat your patients, how you treat people around you, you know, to just kind of try being a good human. <laughs> um, and that's it. So I'm going to go ahead and I think I see some comments. Do you I'm guys sorry. have any? I, I just want to interrupt for like just one minute. Sure. Uh, the Zoom meeting will uh, end in less than one minute. But if you have uh -huh. extra time, we would love you to like, if you could join back with the same link. Is that at all possible? Um. Yes. But do you guys have any questions? Do you want me to stay past one minute? It's up to you. Uh, there are a bunch of questions in the chat. Okay, will I lose the questions when I sign out and sign back in? Yes, but I could just ask everyone to just